favorite copyright attorney. So where, where do we go and I'm just, everything feels like it just enjoying the music. The where do How are you guys doing? It is a very interesting time to be alive now. Unmute the studio here. Say hi to our guests in the studio. Of course, with me is Brandon, our community manager. Welcome, Brandon. Tactical's here in the background. She wasn't feeling well, so everybody wish wish Tactical well in the chat. She's going to be moderating all of your comments. We have a special guest, Nathan, with us here. Nate, uh, is not uh, usually on the program because there's usually some conflicts with his schedule, but he's with us tonight. And um, yeah. welcome, Nathan. Thanks for having me. And of course, Kurt Mueller is here. What's up, everyone? Your favorite cat attorney. How's it going? Good evening, everyone. Nice to be with you again. Don't worry, we'll bring you down in a second. 50 seconds. Five zero. I like it too much. It's from Epidemic Sound. It's pretty good, I think. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Two hundred and sixty-four of you watching now. Hello, Tia Marie. Hello, Basher of Noggins. Hello, Lord Matt and Zena Morks and John Roddy and War Crime and Zizix Wolf and Dustin Rodriguez and the Andro Pontes and JTTV and Holy Mackerel, Alec and Jen Negri and the Wandering Wojak and Alexander. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I know I couldn't possibly get to all of you, so I hope that that, that was a good... Um, that's a, uh, that's okay. Glitch Mod says, so you're a lefty. What about all the left Kalu? Uh, I'm not a lefty. I have beliefs that fall on the left side. I have beliefs that fall on the right hand side. Personally, don't like the two party system. But uh, this really isn't about my beliefs. This is about these extremely remarkable things that are happening in the news. I would be covering this, whether it was someone I agreed with or someone I disagreed with. These are sort of things that make me disagree with people. Oh, crap, yeah. These are things that make me disagree with people, so if, you know, someone that I voted for did these things, I would be just as interested, probably even a little bit more ticked off. But, uh, no, 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 this is going to be a presentation of these four stories. Okay, this, this might be coming back up now. Might be coming back up. Let's see what happens. Somebody else monitor the stream so I don't have to launch it. Oh, there is some video now, that's promising. Yes. You're back up. Yay, okay. Wonderful. Gonna pause my stream. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. The, everything went down there. The whole, the whole graphics card driver went down. All right. So, I don't want to take any more time not getting to this. I will turn down the music. In fact, I'll just turn off the music. All right. 
So I have like absolutely no segue into this. <laughs> but what I understand happened was that we had four four different things have happened. Michael Cohen, who is Trump's attorney, has pled guilty to an information, which is how they do it. He pleads guilty to this this uh, thing called an information. It's like a brief or a pleading, and then that becomes the the guilty thing. Am I about right yep, there? Yeah, you Kurt? got it. And then at the same time, like within hours of each other, Manafort, Paul Manafort, who was at least at one time Trump's campaign manager, and he was part of the campaign for five months or something, was found guilty on eight of 18 federal charges involving bank fraud and tax evasion and money laundering. Yep. And I think many of the, many of the, there were eight counts that he was, that he was found guilty, which is the big deal. And there were 10 things that he was found not, not guilty. No verdict. He was instead no verdict, which is what we would call a mistrial. And then the prosecution gets to decide whether they want a retrial on those 10 things. And we're going to talk about what that means, because that doesn't mean what we think it means either. Then at the also at the same time, here, I'll bring this up on the screen because you haven't seen this yet, I don't think, at least not as many people have. There was a new indictment against the Hunters, uh, one of whom is a member of Congress. They were apparently using hundreds of thousands of dollars, allegedly, using hundreds of thousands of dollars of campaign funds for personal expenses. And this is the, this one's actually the most interesting document, I think, so we're going to go through that. It is 47 pages. We're going to page through it. We're not really going to read these things today, it, at least not word for word. And then there was some kind of order in the, uh, the Christopher Steele uh, defamation case, which had been filed by three Russian oligarchs in the District of Columbia in D.C., and the court denies the, um, or the court grants the motion to dismiss filed by defendants and denies any further motion. Yeah, so, so the entire case was thrown out against Orbis and Christopher Steele. And so I thought we would kind of cover what that is. So those are the four stories. Y y you're not going to get me with this whole donating and then getting like, what about Clinton's fraud and what about this and that? That's great. And, and if you want to present a link or something to a credible source for information, great. But we're talking about these four stories. So I, I don't want to disappoint you. I'm not really going to be paying attention to that. Yeah, I mean, we, we have no objection to covering um, things from any political spectrum. The, yeah, the, the, we're I'm covering absolutely... these because they're, you know, immediately newsworthy. This just happened. But, you know, if there's things that are relevant that we should be discussing, we'll, we'll discuss it. But I, I honestly do not know what the Haiti thing is even referring to. Um, so I, I, I don't even know that about that. Yeah. Okay. So without further ado, because we're not going to get through it unless we get through it, this is the information that Michael Cohen pled guilty to from in or about 2007. From in or about 2007 through in or about January 2017, Michael Cohen was an attorney for a Manhattan-based real estate company. The company, Cohen, held the title of executive vice president and special counsel to the owner of the company, who's referred to as Individual One. Now, yes, it's true. It later goes on and reveals that Individual One later became president of the United States. But I think this is really important. They're going to, throughout this document, refer to this very important position as Individual One. It seems pr pretty obvious to me that this would be done so that it doesn't feel like there's this powerful person and instead it's just here's what's happening with this person and and so you can sort of see it from an un, a less biased perspective or unbiased perspective what do you think kurt 
Well, it's also part of the Department of Justice's standard policy in these things. When they're referring to any sort of uh, potential um, related parties that have not been indicted, they never refer to them by name. They always refer to them by some sort of uh, alias like this. And so that's just part of a long-standing Department of Justice policy. And the fact that you know this particular individual is uniquely identifiable by his position, it makes it a little bit comical, but it's just part of the standard policy of Department of Justice in these matters. It's about not dragging anyone into a case that they haven't um, indicted because, you know, this, this individual hasn't been brought in an indictment. There's not enough information, so they, they leave the name out. Well, there's also a Department of Justice policy for not indicting sitting presidents. Yes, right? there is. So even if there was an indictable offense, we're not sure that the Department of Justice would bring an indictment. Maybe they would do it some other way or simply present all of this to Congress and let Congress decide what to do. Yeah, the Department of Justice has twice issued fairly lengthy memos on the question of whether or not the sitting president can be indicted. And on both occasions, they concluded the answer to that question is no. There is a uh, constitutional argument from particular language in the Constitution, and there's also the structural argument of the fact that the president is the head of the executive branch, which the Department of Justice serves. So it, it creates some structural and po possible constitutional problems. But uh, yeah, they could always refer to Congress and Congress can impeach. So there's always that. And then once he's impeached and convicted and thrown out of office, uh, he can be charged with uh, criminal offenses. If there are any. So Michael Cohen has apparently various loan agreements to taxi operators and is evading paying his taxes is what he's admitted to here. So that's what the first five counts are, evasion of income tax liability. Then in 2010, he, I guess this isn't allegedly anymore since he pled guilty, uh, he executed a $6.4 million promissory note with a bank, a loan, collateralized by the taxi medallions and personally guaranteed by Cohen. A year later, he personally obtained a $6 million line of credit from a bank, also collateralized by the same taxi medallions. Cohen had increased his line of credit from $6 million to $14 million, increasing his personal medallion liabilities to more than $20 million. Then, in 2014, he refinanced his medallion debt at, this, at the one bank with another bank, which shared the debt with a credit union. The transaction was structured as a package of individual loans to the entities that owned Cohen's New York medallions, personally guaranteed by Cohen. Following the loan's closing, Cohen's medallion debt at Bank One was paid off with funds from Bank Two and the credit union. The line of credit was closed. 2013, in connection with his successful application for a mortgage from another bank for his Park Avenue condominium, Michael Cohen, the defendant, disclosed only the $6.4 million medallion loan, so he's not disclosing things properly. He, in an attempt to secure financing from Bank 3 to purchase a summer home for $8.5 million, very nice, again concealed a $14 million line of credit. Cohen misled Bank 3, stating in substance that the $14 million line of credit was undrawn and that he would close it. In truth, it was overdrawn, having swapped it out for a fully drawn larger group of... All right, let me try to find the chat now. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry about that. I really don't know what's going on. Screen starts flashing, and then Chrome crashes, and then Discord crashes, and then the stream goes down. Uh, I'm guessing there was a graphics driver issue or something. All right. So where were we? He's got a 14 million line of credit that he's overdrawn... 
so so he's he's kind of like bouncing his credit around. It looks like he's trying to figure out a way to kind of scam the system and get lots of money out of it, right? Like get lots of lots more credit than than he would normally be due. Yeah, so he's overextending all of his credit. He's taking out this home equity line here, as you can see on nineteen. So he's he's lying to his bank in order to get more money on his home equity loan, which he's going to use not to put money into his home, but for personal use purposes. So it's a fraudulent loan. And here's the good stuff. Campaign finance violations. Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, as amended, regulates the influence of money on politics. At all times relevant, the Election Act set forth the following limitations. Individual comp- contributions to any presidential candidate were limited to $2,700 per election. Corporations were prohibited from making contributions directly to presidential candidates, including expenditures coordinated with candidates. On June 16, 2015, Individual 1 began his presidential campaign, while Michael Cohen, the defendant, continued to work at the company and did not have a formal title. He had a campaign email address at various times advised the campaign, including on matters of interest to the press, and made televised and media appearances on behalf of the campaign. So, so there were questions about what he was actually doing at the campaign besides just appearing on television, right? Like, that's what it looks like. Yeah. At all times relevant to this information, Corporation One was a media company that owns, among other things, a popular tabloid magazine, chairman and chief executive of Corporation One in connection with Michael Cohen, coordination with Michael Cohen, and one or more members of the campaign offered to help deal with negative stories about individual one's relationships with women by, among other things, assisting the campaign in identifying such stories so they could be purchased and their publication avoided. Chairman One agreed to keep Cohen apprised of any such negative stories. Consistent with the agreement described above, Corporation One advised Michael Cohen of negative stories during the campaign, and Cohen, with the assistance of Corporation One, arranged for the purchase of two stories so as to suppress them and prevent them from influencing the election. First, in or about June 2016, a model and actress, Woman One, began attempting to sell her story of an alleged extramarital affair with Individual One that had taken place in 2006 and 2007, knowing the story would be of considerable value because of the election. Woman One retained an attorney who, in in turn, contacted the editor-in-chief of the magazine and offered to sell Woman One's story to Magazine One. Chairman One, Editor One, informed Michael Cohen of the story, at Cohen's urging and subject to Cohen's promise that Corporation One would be reimbursed, Editor One ultimately began negotiating for the purchase of the story. Yeah. So there. So what's happening here is he's buying a story that a tabloid was going to run, which is assumed to be the National Enquirer, who owned this story, and that they were going to buy the story to make sure the story would not appear in the press and that is being labeled as a comp campaign contribution because it would be money expended for the purposes of influencing the campaign but what's interesting to my point of view is that 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 conclusion is a little bit not automatically clear to my mind because what is a campaign contribution and what influences the campaign is is not obvious because if you spend $400 of money, say, on a nice outfit that you're going to wear at a particular event at a campaign rally, for example, would that qualify as a campaign contribution? But if you normally spend $400 on outfits normally in your normal life, that's a personal expense. So what is the line between a personal expense and a campaign expense is not particip- not really clear. So, for example, if... Trump normally bought stories out of the press in order to prevent them from running in his normal every day-to-day life, and that's just a continuing pattern of behavior, then is it personal expense or is it campaign expense? That's not really 100% clear to my mind. Well, that question can be asked. It sounds, it, it, it sounds like it's something that can be cleared up pretty easily. You look look at the factual history of person whether they've done this before, and let them present their defenses. And I mean, if it was anyone not the president, you would they would be indicted, and you let it, you'd leave it up to a jury. 
right? And I mean, it's a tax question, right? So it's the same question as to whether whether something that is a business expense can be used personally after it's not being used anymore. Um, isn't it? I mean, isn't it the same question here? Yeah, I, I'm similar to that question, you have a fair point because you could buy something in the name of the business or you could buy something in the name of your individual and it could be the same thing. So if you use business money for a business expense, put it on your business report that comes with certain obligations. But the thing with campaign contributions that makes it interesting is the candidate himself is not limited on how much money he can spend. So other people are limited, but the candidate isn't limited. The candidate can spend unlimited amount of money from his personal funds and he can donate unlimited money to his own campaign. So it's not clear if he normally would spend money to keep it out of the press. Like if, if you or I were rich and there was a story about us, would we spend money to keep it out of the press? We might. So whether or not it's a campaign expense or a personal expense, it's not clear, even if it camp came from campaign funds, if it comes from Trump, since Trump can donate unlimited funds, it's not, whether or not it's a campaign expense is not 100% clear. I think, you know, that would be the line of defense if I were trying to defend Trump, Trump on a potential charge. I would be saying it's just a personal expense and not a, 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 a campaign expense. The problem for Cohen yep. is that is the, the business aspect of it. He was running it through these businesses and businesses can't spend money in this way on campaigns. So Cohen might be guilty of a crime, even if Trump is not. And that's an interesting aspect to this in my mind. Uh, the second was on or about October 8th, 2016, the adult film actress, Woman 2, who I'm assuming is uh, Stormy Daniels, Stephanie Clifford, informed Editor 1 that Woman 2 was willing to make public statements and confirm on the record her past affair with Individual 1, put them in touch. Cohen negotiated a $130,000 agreement for her silence, received a signed confidential settlement agreement, and a separate side letter agreement from Attorney 1. I think we've all seen those now. Mm -hmm. The defendant did not immediately execute the agreement, nor did he pay Woman 2 on the evening of October 25th, 2016. With no deal with Woman 2 finalized, Attorney 1 told Editor 1 that Woman 2 was close to completing a deal with another outlet to make her story public. Editor 1, in turn, texted Michael Cohen that we have to coordinate something on the matter Attorney 1 is calling you about, or it could look awfully bad for everyone. Chairman 1 and Editor 1 then called Michael Cohen through an encrypted telephone application. Cohen agreed to make the payment, then called Attorney 1 to finalize the I, I do love the fact and, that he used the word coordinate specifically, since campaign finance law makes it illegal to coordinate with a candidate like this. So the fact he used that magic word is just an extra level of stupid. Also, it's very interesting that the same attorney is representing two separate people who have stories about individual one, isn't it? Oh, no, no, it's not that unusual. The, 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 um, the publication contacted the attorney and offered to sell it to him. So the, 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 uh, New, the National Enquirer contacted Cohen and said, essentially, would you like to buy this story? Oh, that's very – is that common practice to sell stories that could – I don't, know. I don't know. You'd have to ask the National Enquirer. Yeah, they would tell us. The next day on October 26, 2016, Michael Cohen, the defendant, emailed an incorporating service to obtain the corporate formation documents for a shell corporation, Essential Consultants, LLC, which Cohen had incorporated a few days prior. That evening, or that afternoon, Cohen drew down $131 from the fraudulently obtained home equity line of credit discussed above and requested that it be deposited into a bank account Cohen had just opened in the name of Essential Consultants. The next morning, on October 27, 2016, Cohen went to Bank 3 and wired $130,000 from Essential Consultants to Attorney 1. On the bank form to complete the wire, Cohen falsely indicated that the purpose of the wire being sent was a retainer. On or about November 1, 2016, Cohen received from Attorney One copies of the final signed confidential settlement agreement and side letter agreement. 
Michael Cohen, the defendant, caused and made the payments described herein in order to influence the 2016 presidential election. In doing so, he coordinated with one or more members of the campaign, including through meetings and phone calls, about the fact, nature, and timing of the payments. As a result of the payments solicited and made by Michael Cohen, the defendant, neither Woman 1 nor Woman 2 spoke to the press prior to the election. So that's interesting. Yeah. Thoughts, comments, anyone? Well, I, I, I think what's really damning about it all is is just all the all the maneuvering and shell aspects of it. You know, that's what gets really is that all these things and deceptions and he's putting false statements on these bank statements and misleading the bank and it's all part of a, a pattern of conduct that shows a guilty mind. You know, that's that's one of the things that you look for is that is that mens rea. It's like you're looking for the guilty mind. Well, how do you know that Michael Cohen thought what he was doing was wrong? Well, the fact that he, he did all these behaviors trying to cover his tracks shows a criminal mind. And so it shows the intent to try to evade certain things. And I think that's one of the reasons that he's getting... Uh, what did we say between uh, five and seven years, something like that, according to the plea agreement? I have it here somewhere. It's uh, 40, 46 to 63 months, according to the stipulated agreement uh, that they're going to sentence him to. So he's going to spend some quality time in jail. Um, based on what you've read already, Blackleaf and Leonard, do you think that if he hadn't been using fraudulent credit accounts and fraudulent bank accounts, um, to move all this money around, he would be in the situation he's in right now? Well, certainly would have avoided a lot of the specific charges. I mean, all the bank fraud charges and all the, the bank wire fraud charges are related to all that stuff with the deception. As for the campaign finance stuff on its own, if it, it had just been a clean expense, I don't know. And also the fact that, see, the problem is twofold. First, the, the coordination between Trump campaign and an independent business, you're not allowed to do it like that. But it, yeah, whether or not if Trump had just written a check directly from his own personal account, whether that would be illegal is a more interesting and subtle question to my mind. Yeah. Okay, moving right along. Manafort was found guilty on eight counts, one, two, three, four, five, 12, 25, and 27. Um, do we have a list? I believe we were supposed to have a list that um, I can't even scroll up here. I love I love the way this works. Adobe will not let you scroll up if the document ends. I can I can very carefully do this. Hang on. Nope, it won't even let me do that. I'm looking for the counts as well. Wonderful, wonderful Adobe. Thank you very much for being such a quality program. There we go. Yeah. Now, it's important to mention in the case of Manafort that these charges relate to things that happened a decade ago. So unlike the case with Cohen, where it's co coinciding with the time that he was um, campaign director or otherwise for the Trump campaign, in Manafort's case, this doesn't relate to Trump directly. Manafort's crimes relate to things that happened 10 years ago. So that's important to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, prosecutors said Manafort collected $65 million in foreign bank accounts from 2010 to 2014 and spent $15 million on luxury purchases in the same period. Yeah, he was, he was spend, spending way above his means and uh, not declaring them, so all kinds of problems. And he's facing, theoretically, 80 years in jail, but uh, no, that's the statutory maximum, and that's not going to happen. I, I've been looking. He's also sixty-eight years old. He's or fifty-eight years old or sixty-eight years old. Yeah. He's going to be spending the rest of his life in jail potentially. Possibly. I, I think. I mean, I don't know for sure. I've been looking around to see if anyone's done an estimate of how many years he's likely to get. My my bet is something between five and ten years. Is the is my number that I think he's going to get? But um, yeah. I don't think it's going to be anything like life. I, yeah, the highest count he was convicted of as a 30-year statutory max, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think I think five to seven years is, is more likely. 
He's 69 years okay. old, and he's currently being booked in Virginia. Um, yeah. so do we know anything about um, about early release in Virginia or anything like that? Oh no, this is this is this is federal. This is federal case. It was okay. at a, it was in a courthouse in Virginia. It's a, it, it was, uh, but it's a federal case, and under federal law, you have to serve 85 percent of your sentence. Uh, okay. You can get you can get good behavior time that will take uh, take off some time. But federal law doesn't federal uh, does not have parole, so you you must serve eighty five percent of your convict of your okay. sentence. And Manafort is still facing seven more counts that have yet to be tried in the District of Columbia because of jurisdictional reasons they couldn't be put together. So Manafort is still facing a whole bunch more counts um, in a D.C. court. Okay, moving along. There were also a pair, a husband and wife pair, who were indicted for campaign finance violations and or misappropriation of funds in California. The Hunters, Duncan Hunter and Margaret Hunter, maintained a joint checking account, joint savings account. Checking account was used as their primary bank account for paying virtually all the bills, rarely used the joint savings account, and maintained a minimal balance. As reflected in his U.S. House of Representatives annual financial disclosure, Duncan Hunter had less than $1,000 in reportable assets for each of the years 2009 through 2016. Throughout the relevant period, the Hunters spent substantially more than they earned. They overdrew their bank account more than 1,100 <laughs> times in a seven-year period, resulting in approximately $37,761 in overdraft fees, that's ridiculous. That They're, makes that me that feel alone. a little better about my situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah I've done that, that maybe like once or illegal. twice. That alone should be illegal. I'm not sure what the, what the crime should be, but 1,100 times for $37,000 in overdraft fees? Holy God, man. That's uh, a whole new that's level of like, responsible. Wow. You shouldn't be allowing the banks to profit that much off of you. <laughs> the, 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 these are your representatives, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, their credit cards were frequently charged to the credit limit, often with five-figure balances, re resulting in approximately $24,600 in finance charges, interest, and other fees related to late, over-the-limit, and return payment fees. Now, this doesn't say if it was over the course of the whole 2009 through 2016 seven years thing. I'm not saying that really makes it any better, but, you know, seven, that, that in one year versus that in seven years is a different thing. Twenty five thousand dollars in interest on credit cards. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm paying that in my student loans. Hey yo. Um, nah. Um, so they are accused in count one conspiracy to knowingly and willfully convert campaign funds to personal use by using them to fulfill personal commitments, obligations, expenses that would have existed irrespective of the election campaign and duties as a federal office holder in amounts of twenty five thousand dollars or more. Knowing, knowing an intent to defraud, knowingly conceal, cover up, etc. Yep. Manner and means. They illegally converted and stole more than a quarter million dollars in campaign funds, facilitated the theft by directing the treasurer to obtain a campaign credit card for Margaret Hunter at a time when she had no official role with the campaign. They installed margaret hunter as his paid campaign manager despite the protests of the treasurer and with full knowledge of her long history of misuse of campaign funds in part because as they discussed they needed the extra money that would come from her salary uh -huh. they disregarded rules impl implemented by the treasurer to track legitimate expenses such as not purchasing gas using campaign funds withdrawing cash from atms using petty cash without keeping a proper record of how it was spent and failing to provide receipts which listed the names of donors and volunteers from whom Margaret Hunter claimed to be spending campaign funds. And when pressed by the treasurer to comply, they dismissed the rules as silly. Yeah, so when your accountant is telling you, I need things to help account, the proper answer is not, that's silly. Uh, standard accounting practices? Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason why accountants have to have, you know, a certification. They are in a position of trust. Uh, it, it, but wait, friends, it gets much, much it, worse. Yes. 
Duncan facilitated the hunter's theft of campaign funds by ignoring his campaign staff's multiple warnings about Margaret Hunter's improper use of campaign funds, accusing campaign staff of disloyalty by trying to create some kind of paper trail on me when they raised concerns about improper spending, and continually refusing to remove her access to campaign funds. Yes, they wanted to create a paper trail that was, in fact, the exact idea. Yeah, that, that a paper trail on a public figure using public funds. Y- y- like, yeah, they could be accounted for. That's that, the that's, goal. You're supposed to have a paper trail. <laughs> that's that's how it works. <laughs> you can have privacy in your private life, like your private purchases. Margaret Hunter concealed and disguised the personal nature of her many campaign expenditures by refusing to allow the campaign fundraiser to review her credit card statements and spending. The Hunters concealed and disguised the personal nature of many of their campaign expenditures by either falsely stating the expenses were campaign-related or by falsely reporting the item or service purchased when providing information to the treasurer. For example, buying personal clothing items at a golf course so that the purchase could be falsely reported to the treasurer as balls for the wounded warriors. <sighs> oh that's my just, god. Yeah, that's that's great. So we're now spending campaign money on personal expenses and we're claiming we're doing it for wounded veterans. So we're just all yeah. kinds of special at this point, aren't we? Margaret Hunter concealed and disguised her family's use of campaign funds for personal vacations by reserving hotels and paying other personal vacation expenses through Expedia with the expectation that campaign records would not reveal the names or locations of their destinations. Duncan Hunter belatedly attempted to arrange supposed campaign-related meetings during family vacations to conceal and disguise the fact that the Hunters were using campaign funds for personal family vacations. The Hunters concealed and disguised the personal nature of their family's purchases of video games using campaign funds by falsely claiming to a financial institution that the payments were fraudulent charges and then reporting the purchases to the FEC as the and the public as fraudulent charges. So now we're making false statements to a government agency. That's always really, really promising and will in no way get you 10 years in prison. I want to know what video games they purchased. Uh, yeah, that's what critical do, detail here. What do people like this play? You don't hear that very uh, often. I didn't know our politicians played video games. I thought they were. I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess The Sims, <laughs> and and Democracy Three. Okay. Yeah, that'd be good if it was Democracy Three. That'd be nice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, paper. Uh, Papers, uh, Papers, please. please. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. <laughs> All glory to our Statska. Yeah, we will now take suggestions on the most inappropriate games you can spend campaign money on. Maybe they're the playing on Klosnovka in Farming Simulator. The Farming Simulator, yes. We're doing research yeah. on our core constituency, the farmers. <laughs> it's so true. The hunters discussed how much money was in their family bank accounts in order to determine when it was necessary to purchase certain goods or services with campaign funds and to withdraw cash, uh, cash from campaign accounts. Discussing, for example, that they withdraw petty cash all the time with the former treasurer, it was great. Uh huh. The hunters monitored the amount of cash on hand that was maintained by the campaign and would moderate their theft of campaign funds when the amount was excessively low or depleted. Duncan Hunter facilitated the hunter's theft of campaign funds by giving Margaret Hunter his campaign credit and debit cards so that she could use them to purchase a wide variety of family groceries, household items, and personal gifts. They concealed and disguised the personal nature of many of their campaign expenditures by attempting to have the campaign's name taken off the official campaign credit cards. Mm -hmm. They illegally used campaign funds, among other things, to purchase the following. Hotel rooms airline tickets, upgrades, meals and food, entertainment expenses for vacations for themselves and their friends and family, including more than $14,000 for a family Thanksgiving vacation in Italy in November 2015, more than $6,500 for a family vacation to Hawaii in April 2015, more than $3,700 for a family vacation to Las Vegas and Boise in July 2015, 
more than $2,400 for a Las Vegas couples vacation in August 2011, and more vacations to destinations such as Lake Tahoe, yep. Pittsburgh, London, and Washington, Here, D.C. Here's a thought. If you have $37,000 in late fees and insufficient charges from your bank, and $25,000 of interest on your credit card, perhaps you should not make these kinds of expenses, such as a $14,000 trip to Italy. Perhaps that is beyond your means, and you should stop doing that. Yeah. You guys, you, you, you know, you've, you've seen all the wonderful vacation uh, video that I've shot for you, right? <laughs> yeah, because I don't do that because I can't afford it right now. So we're not doing the Lawful Masses retreat in Bora Bora this year? Um, it would probably be in Cozumel. That's where I, that's where <laughs> I prefer. Maybe, um, maybe Japan someplace? Ooh. Yeah, let's go to um, Kyoto. Oh, okay. Food and drinks for themselves and their friends and family at various restaurants, such as Mr. A's, The Capitol Grill, Bellagio Olives, Spago, Caesar's Mesa Grill, Sally's Fish House. Uh, hey, I recognize some of these. These are expensive Cap Capitol Grill is expensive. It's nice. Recommend it if you're in the D.C. area and you have a, have yeah. a buck to spare. Although, um, I think I could make a, a steak just as good as they can now. That steak I had today was pretty damn it good. It nice. The sous vide steaks, the best oh. things. You got to try it out. Um, yeah. Household and other personal items for their family from a wide variety of stores, such as Costco, where they spent more than $11,000 in campaign funds, Walmart, more than $5,700, Barnes & Noble, more than $2,500, Target, more than $2,300, Michaels, $2,200, and other retailers such as Aaron Brothers, Party City, World Market, Crate & Barrel, Pier 1, JCPenney, Sears, and Rite Aid. Sears. Who Ugh. goes to Sears anymore? Se Sears doesn't exist anymore. Business. It's Sears and Kmart. Just I don't even know how they're still in business. Sears isn't in business, and J.C. Penney is one step behind them. Sears is gone. So beer, wine, alcohol, and groceries for themselves, their family, friends at various stores, including more than nine thousand dollars spent at Vons, Albertsons, Hagen, and the Miramar Commissary. Commissary. Food for themselves and their children at various fast food restaurants, $3,300 at In-N-Out, Carl's Jr., Jack in the Box. Yeah, this is definitely California because um, we don't have Menchie's frozen yogurt. We don't have too many Jack in the Box or Carl's Jr. out here, and we definitely don't have In-N-Out. Oh, or Panda Express. Sorry, I do want to correct you. You do have Menchie's here. We do have Menchie's. They're really We're good as well. I recommend it. I'll have to check it out. Could also be uh, Texas. Tobacco, pers Okay. Tobacco, personal items, various sundries at airport kiosks, airline tickets totaling more than $15,000 for, among others, their children, other relatives, family, friends, and the family pet. The hunters agreed to repay the campaign for their malversation. Wow, that's a new word. Malversation, M-A-L-V-E-R-S-A-T-I-O-N. I've got to look that one yep. up. I'm assuming that's conversion. Uh, malversation is corrupt behavior in a position of trust, especially in public office. All right. Okay. Well, Mal, that's a new one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that word in my pocket. Only when and if the treasurer inquired further and insisted on repayment, repayment would avoid attention where the personal nature of the purchase was evident, the FEC highlighted what appeared to be personal use of campaign funds and warned Duncan Hunter that it might consider taking further legal action, or the news media or Duncan Hunter's constituents requested explanations for expenditures that appeared to be personal on their face. So let, let me make sure that we get this point correctly here, because point number three, with the FEC highlighting, what that means is they were repaying the campaign when the FEC sent up a flag saying, hey... This looks like it might be a personal expense, and yet they kept doing it, even though they knew the FEC was watching their accounts. Yeah. How is, stupid do is... you have to be? Hey, we're watching yeah. your expenses. Oh, we're going to still take money for personal expenses. Wow, that's pretty dense. I think someone was addicted to a lifestyle.
Well, their lifestyle is about to change substantially, so yay. Yeah, this isn't the kind of addiction where you get to get a you know any sort of mental health credit for either. They spent three hundred and fifty-one dollars on a rental car to drive to a to, to a personal ski trip. A thousand dollars for a Lake Tahoe resort for food, drinks, three nights lodging during the personal ski trip. Hey, I went to uh, to Lake Tahoe. It's it's nice up there and everything, but you know, there's there's better skiing. Maybe maybe I maybe I wasn't at the right place. Um, well, now you know where to go. You have a recommendation. Yes, we have some recommendations. The Hyatt Regency is uh, the place to be. Two thousand six hundred dollars to Barnes and Noble to purchase items for family and friends. More beer and hotel stays. And the treasurer suggested that the credit card be taken away. Duncan acknowledged that her use of the campaign card could be a serious problem, Ugh. but declined to take it away. Jeez, man. Why don't they just say, put up a sign that says, please send me to jail? It would save time. Yeah, this was just a matter of time. This one wasn't even a question. If any of this is true, and I'm assuming it's all true, this this people are going to jail for this. It just keeps it keeps going, by the way. We're only on page 15 of 47. So I'm not going to keep going through this at this pace. So let's page through it a little bit here. Duncan Hunter had spent $142 to have men's warehouse recut two pairs of pants. When this was uncovered by the treasurer, he falsely explained, LOL, <laughs> men's warehouse was a possible semi-embarrassment that I had to let ride. I used the wrong card that I didn't want to explain the forced refund. Uh -huh. Used the wrong card. You used, sure. used the wrong card about 87 times, apparently. 87 times in a row, yeah. Did he have yes, any I other accident, I accidentally, uh, Yeah, I accidentally stabbed the victim 15 <laughs> times. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut them. It was an accident. This guy seems like a very um, hip young person buying video, gar car video games and saying to the treasurer, LOL, in a text message. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I think yeah. he... Uh, I think he was addicted to a lifestyle and had some issues with not living the lifestyle which he envisioned as as louis ck might say you know oh i didn't get to go my favorite way oh oh i have to just cut across three lanes of traffic because i didn't get to go my favorite way you know that this is the same sort of thing like like people just can't not for some reason why I mean, if I don't have the money, I don't go out and find ways to steal it so that I can live the lifestyle that I deserve. I mean, this sounds narcissistic. Really. And this is essentially what happened to Manafort, too. It is essentially exactly the same thing. Manafort was living well beyond his means and had to commit all these criminal acts to support his incredibly inflated lifestyle. So it's like, you know, just just stop doing that would be great. Mechanic87 asks whether this guy learned his spending habits from the West Virginia Supreme Court judges. Yeah. Maybe. Good, good one. He was a senator, right? House of Rep. This is uh, House of Representatives. Okay. Do we know what state he represents? California. California. Yeah. California. Okay. And he is an elected Republican, although I'm not bringing that up to, like, you know, rag on, oh, look, this is this is indicative of all Republicans. I'm sure that there are bad actors on both sides, not to quote my favorite president. No, I, I tend to lean in that direction, and I have no problem calling this guy a total asshole. So. Oh, yeah, this guy's a total asshole. I just didn't mean to. I'm not saying, you know, what his political affiliation is specifically, you know, because I'm trying to spread, you know, hey, this is this guy's that kind of... And look at this again on 116. Go back up to 116 on this, where he talks about, again, with the, the wounded veterans thing, because it's like, yeah. I, mean, I mean, come on. Do we really have to pretend that we are, we're embezzling money from our campaign again, and we're saying that we did it for wounded veterans. 
again. Yeah, Why? she's taking advantage of the wounded warriors. They're saying here that she wanted to buy some Hawaii shorts and Duncan Hunter wanted to buy them for her, but he had run out of money, so she told him to go to a golf pro shop, buy the shorts there, and then call it a, a golf ball purchase for the wounded warriors. I mean, that's pretty low. That's that's pretty damn low. That's that to me shows a level of crassness or or that lack of care. I don't know. It'd be w- w- would it make a real difference if 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 she I don't know, also actually bought golf balls for the wounded warriors and really did donate them or something? I don't know. If that makes it any better. Well, how many wounded warriors are able to play golf? I, I, I would too. imagine a fair amount. I mean, I know that the that the the hunting community will take wounded veterans out, even ones that are in uh uh, you know, uh, and motorized wheelchairs and stuff, and they'll take them. Yeah. They'll take them hunting. You know, to try. And, let, so, and let's not forget, you do not need to be able to swing a club to be able to play golf. Yeah. They do make clubs for handicapped people or otherwise disabled people who, or, or elderly people even, who just can't swing a club anymore. Where there's like a little, a little charge, like a little blank. Uh, yeah, like a little. And you know what? I, I, I doubt that they just thought of this randomly off the top of their head. I bet you dollars no. to donuts they knew for an absolute fact there was some program in the Wounded Warriors to help to help them with golf yeah. because they they knew yeah. that was exist they knew that existed and that was the excuse they gave so I'm, yeah I think they spent eighty seven fifty in campaign funds at Fandango to purchase movie tickets to conceal and disguise the payment they told the treasurer the charge was gift tickets towards a local league football fundraiser uh-huh. wouldn't that also still be a misuse yes I don't know that might be that might be well possible for the campaign use I mean if it's a legitimate campaign expense to say we want to buy tickets for a fundraiser. So you could imagine as a charity auction, we're donating these tickets. They're provided by the campaign for whatever. Get your name out. I buy it. They classified a SeaWorld Aquatica Family Water Park uh, Day as an educational tour (laughs) related to a day-long entrance and educational meet on their issues and programs. Uh They spent $700 in campaign funds at a local dentist to continue to pay down the family's overdue balance. In order to conceal and disguise this illegal payment, she told the treasurer the part of that, that part of the payment was a charitable contribution to Smiles for Life. Why do we have to keep bringing charities into this? <laughs> so horrible. This person, these people are scumbags. Holy man. They're not even that smart about it either. No. They have people overseeing this, and they're trying to pull this off. I don't, I don't get it. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't even know what to liken this to. This is so unbelievably obvious that this was just a matter of time. It's, it, it's. I don't know. It's like leaving your license plate at a hit and run. Obviously, you got away for a minute, but they're gonna catch up with you. Yeah, I, I don't know about anyone else on this, but of the three that we've discussed so far, Cohen, Manafort, and Hunter, yeah, I guess where my outrage is the highest. It's Hunter. So yeah, it's like, I, I hope I hope of the three, outrageous. Hunter spends the most quality time in jail. Because even Cohen wasn't this low. This is a whole other level of low. Yeah. So I'm going to stop there with that. Otherwise, we'll be here forever. But we were having so much fun flogging, flogging them to death. <laughs> We could keep flogging them for another 15 pages. So then finally, just to uh, end, this is going to be a short one because I don't want to spend too much time on whether, you know, who Chris Steele is and all that and the political implications. But Chris Steele and Orbis Business Intelligence were sued by German Khan, one uh, and two other Russian oligarchs who are very wealthy people in Russia who have a lot of political influence and power. And they sued this Orbis and Business Intelligence Limited and Christopher Steele in the District of Columbia for the the Steele uh, dossier, claiming that it was 
some kind of defamation. Some kind, it was damaging to them. It was false, and it was it was some kind of defamation. In in dismissing the case, the judge goes into what strategic lawsuits against public participation are, and let me see if I can find quickly in here. Yes, here we go. The summary of the of the dossier. Um, Alpha Group has a close relationship with President Vladimir Putin. Significant favors continue to be done in both directions of Fridman and Avon, still giving informal advice to Putin. The key intermediary of the relationship is Oleg Govorun, who delivered illicit cash directly to Putin. Uh, throughout the 90s when Putin was deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. President Putin is not personally bothered about Alpha's current lack of investment in Russia, but he is able to exploit it as a lever over Alpha's interlocutors. Um, not sure. Let's see. So the judge goes into the anti slap Act. A slap is a strategic lawsuit against public participation filed by one side of a political or public policy debate aimed to punish or prevent the expression of opposing points of view. Under the D.C. anti slap Act, the party filing a special motion to dismiss was first show entitlement to the provisions of the Act by making a prima facie showing that the claim at issue arises from an Act in furtherance of the right of advocacy on issues of public interest. So they're saying the steal the dossier is uh, an issue of public interest. Once the prima facie showing is made, the burden shifts to the non-moving party, the plaintiff, who must demonstrate that the claim is likely to succeed on the merits. Once the burden has shifted to claim it, the statute requires more than mere reliance on allegations and mandates the production of evidence that supports the claim. So... The judge goes on to talk about defamation and how defamation is a false statement made to a third party that results in damage to a, a plaintiff, a potential plaintiff. A statement is defamatory if it tends to injure the plaintiff in his trade, profession, or community standing. In defamation cases that rely on statements made about public figures concerning matters of public concerns, plaintiffs must prove by clear and convincing evidence that defendants acted with actual malice. If any of this sounds familiar, we went over a lot of this in the Bob Murray, John Oliver, last week tonight lawsuit. And and then that, of course, got thrown out as well under a similar uh, stat, uh, standard. Plaintiffs make four arguments. Defendants cannot seek protection under anti-slap acts because they are not entitled to any protections of the First Amendment. Defendants do not make the prima facie case that we talked about. Plaintiffs have shown that have uh, have shown that they are likely to succeed, and plaintiffs are at least entitled to discovery. And instead of reading through all of this, let me see if I can fast forward a little bit and find out what the judge said at the end. Plaintiffs are correct that the anti slap Act was not enacted to immunize surreptitious, for-hire, intelligent operatives who defame private citizens. However, the anti slap Act was enacted to protect the right of advocacy on issues of public interest and does not exempt advocates if they can be described as surreptitious, for-hire intelligence operatives. Nor does the anti slap Act immunize any defamatory statement, whether the information was obtained surreptitiously or openly, or for hire or for other reasons. The Act allows defamation suits involving statements about issues of public interest to proceed, provided that the subjects of the alleged defamatory statements offer evidence that they are likely to succeed. Plaintiffs have failed to provide such evidence. Accordingly, the court orders that the special motion is granted, an additional motion to dismiss is denied as it is now moot, and the case is dismissed with prejudice. Sure. With prejudice means the case cannot be filed again. It go away, never it come back. Adjudicated, go away. Yeah. Now, they would have some right to appeal sure. if they can find grounds to do so. Good luck. But that appears to be the end of the fight over whether the steel dossier is defamation. <laughs> the Russian oligarchs either failed to meet the legal standard or simply didn't have facts to meet the legal standard 
for defamation. Yep, and that's why it's good that we have these anti-slap laws and why it would be nice to have a broader one for federal law in general. You know, this was a federal case, but it was a federal case in D.C. So in D.C., yeah. uh, the state courts are federal courts because D.C. is a federal jurisdiction. So that's why a federal court is applying what is essentially a state law because it's the state court for the purposes yeah. of the exercise. So it would be nice if we had a more general federal law that would cover everyone everywhere um, so we don't have this problem because speech is good. Yeah, and then the other, the other, the second part of this is what would have happened in this case had they had DC not had an anti slapped act. And this is why slap acts were enacted, or anti slap acts were enacted. If this case was allowed to proceed into discovery, it's possible that the plaintiffs would have access to the discovery of relevant information and be able to request information, sensitive information that they really don't deserve because they ultimately didn't have a case. It just means that these kinds of, of anti-speech lawsuits get thrown out earlier before they become a bigger hassle for the defendant and thus the, yeah. excuse me, the, before they become a, a bigger, a bigger problem for the potential, I guess it is defendant. And then, um, uh, really do have a stifling effect on speech. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's really, it's really positive because people use lawsuits from time to time as just a uh, measure to try to intimidate people to prevent them from saying things that they dislike. And so these lawsuits yeah. um, often have fee-shifting remedies or other remedies. So if someone brings a lawsuit for an illicit purpose, you can get your money back from your lawyer and you can also sometimes get additional damages on top of that. So, um, you know, it's, it's really good. Someone asked in the chat, uh, Leonard about the, uh, fake cop. Was there any news on that on your end? I, I know nope, no nothing day. new here. The la the latest info I have from them is that the license plate does not come back to a person matching that description or that car. Well, so it appears that it's either a Pennsylvania resident who slapped uh, New Jersey plates on their car, which I think is pretty clever. Like, how would how would anybody ever check that? Then Pennsylvania cops wouldn't automatically be checking whether a a car with New Jersey plates has the proper plates on it. But Pennsylvania cops would be checking Pennsylvania plates for whether they are on the right car or not, just automatically, just drive bys. You know, I saw one go by the other day, uh, uh, an unmarked car that had two front cameras and two rear cameras with the with the special um, IR blasters around the uh, around the cameras, and they're just taking pictures of license plates as they drive by. And eventually, one will hit something, and they'll either tell somebody to go, you know, get that car or get that person, or they'll pull over and get that car. Um, I'm guessing that that doesn't work if if the plates are from out of state. That they don't just automatically be able to look up everybody's name and address and description and everything if they're from out of state. So that's not a bad idea if you're trying to impersonate a police officer to use uh, uh, plates from a different state. Except, of course, your 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 person you're trying to your your victim might actually notice that then. Yeah. Yeah, it's not so. exactly subtle. Yeah. So, but um, no, 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 no news from that. Um, I've been extra vigilant just in case I have anything to worry about. And we have, we've licensed that video out to Viral Hog. I get to keep my video, but I licensed any further use of the video out to Viral Hog, so I don't have to deal with it. I'll let them deal with it. Cool. So I would like to read some super chats and some questions for you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Glitch Mod donated a total of eight dollars, so thanks so much to Glitch Mod. Thank you. Um, Ace Both, uh, he did a super chat for uh, two dollars CA. Um, he's asking about the guy that just got wrecked, but I'm not sure what the context is here. So, um, oh, that was the other guy donating. Oh, okay. Um, Paul, <laughs> Paul Delaney donated five dollars um and, and i agree i'm not sure exactly if, if anybody got wrecked but no uh, i don't think anybody that's not what we're here for i i appreciate getting wrecked just as everybody as much as anybody else does but that's not what we're here for on this channel. no no and uh trekkie 0623 uh, donated two dollars saying thanks for covering uh, thanks for the awesome work covering legal news thank you 
Um, and I'm sorry that we don't have like some dynamite stuff to go over this evening. This is more of a discussion. I'm trying to understand what's going on here too. Sorry for the stream uh, technical difficulties too. I mean, it's just like the entire country. I mean, this essentially America has erupted into this pandemonium with these yeah. indictments that and these charges. I, so, I really like the way one commentator said it. They said uh, Trump really will be responsible for. Uh, an increase in in people's productivity. As soon as all this is over, everyone will get back to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I also have a few questions for you. Um, question from Gucci Hero Le- Leonard. Apparently, oh no, sorry, Gucci Hero Guzzy Hero Leonard. Who is your favorite copyright attorney? Oh. I don't know that I have aspired to any particular copyright attorneys. Nimmer. Um, see, I, I, I think like that's cool that Nimmer has written the treatise on copyright, but I can't say that I aspire to Nimmer. I don't know any. I don't know Nimmer. I don't know anything about his or her personality. I think it's a him, but I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I aspire a little bit to Posner, but just because Posner is such a a well-regarded writer, at least until lately, um, until he's gotten a little bit older, and I don't know if that has something to do with it. But uh, hey, Zizix, uh, thank you very much. Um, You know, what got me interested in copyright law was the DMCA. Actually, it it was Congress. By writing the DMCA, and I watched the radio station deregulation in 1996 or whatever and everything became clear channel and i became very interested in rights in media and i aspired to be a copyright attorney because of that it was frankly it was articles on slash dot that got me interested in copyright at first yeah i mean I, I was the same same way my interest in in technology law i got interested in technology law uh uh, when I was still in high school uh, with from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the work that they were doing online even back yeah. then. Um, so that's how I got interested in technology law. And I, I went to undergrad to study computer science with the idea of going into cyber law as a eventual field. And then I realized I qualified for this thing called the patent bar. And so then I took that and now I'm a patent lawyer. So that's how that went came to be. Yeah. And there, but for the grace of God, go I. <laughs> I was looking in pa- into patent law as well, but I have an IT degree, not an engineering degree. Even though I went to school for the first two years for engineering, I never actually made it through all the math and everything. There were all sorts of other personal reasons. My family lost their business, and my girlfriend cheated on me, and I took too many courses, and I just fell apart. Like, I didn't, I couldn't academically swim anymore at that point. Yeah. And so I c- completed a much much easier IT degree. Um, and I have a, a, an information systems with a management focus, master, uh, master's and bachelor's, and uh, then I went to law school. And I think they accepted me into law school because of the diverse background. But I have that unfinished engineering degree that really eats away at my soul. I really need to finish that at some point just to, just to not have that one thing eating at me. I, I, I will focus someday and figure out the math and and get myself through the 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 rest of my engineering degree yeah someone asked if (laughs) Cohen recording his client is normal behavior for an attorney not any attorney i've ever heard of no 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 you shouldn't be recording your clients unless you think that there's really something super illegal going on and even then i'd kind of coordinate with authorities on that one well thank you so much wow. joe that's nice joe bevan says he's dying for some i'll get this right dying for some Mueller commentary on the Mueller probe keep it up <laughs> leonard <laughs> Yeah, I um, I'm I'm super eager to to see how this all plays out. But at the same time, this is the slowness with which the law works, and what I don't like about it is that it allows bad people to continue doing bad things until they get until the law catches up with them, and that's sometimes that's sometimes a lot to yeah. ask. I I was people I was super tempted. Justice. Because uh, the the trial for Manafort is is right near my office. I had to walk by it every day with the press camped out out there every day, and every day I was super tempted to somehow wind up in a conversation with the press and just troll them, and because you know eventually hopefully they ask for my name and be like, oh my name is Mueller, 
because I have an ID that says that's my name because, you know, it's spelled yeah. the same way and see if I could troll them into something. So well, I didn't do it because I'm yeah. good. Well, there's lots of attorneys. This is kind of an important thing. There's lots of attorneys who are more or less trolling the press right now. They go on ABC or CBS or CNN or Fox or any one of them and say stuff. And it's not always true. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm a little frustrated this evening because I don't know stuff about this. I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you how federal prosecution works and all that. And I'm used to me, be, being able to tell you things. So this is more so me just reading and asking questions and hoping that Kurt knows more than I do. Speaking and of which, getting frustrated at our technological difficulties. Speaking of which, we have a question for Blackleaf. Um, why does the president even have the ability to pardon people? Well, that's a really. Uh, I mean, the the origin of the question is from the is from the king is from is from the king's right to to pardon people. So, it's a leftover power from from royalty. Why why the founders chose to include it as one of their one of their powers when they were creating the executive? That's a whole other question. Um, there are a lot of people who question it, but I guess the idea, at least in principle, and it's not that unusual for governors to have the equivalent power in their states. But I guess the idea is it's sort of a last check on the system to correct for problems that can't be corrected somewhere else. You know, a, a political act to correct a legal wrong. Yeah. So remember, the president is supposed to be more or less a leader position, yeah. you know, doing the will of the people. Yeah. And one of the problems with this particular election, no matter what political aspect your 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 what political side you're on. This was the second least popular elected president. Yeah, and I mean, I can with... I can give you an example off the top of my head of where where a pardon was was perhaps a good thing. I remember a situation with a a woman who was a Pennsylvania native, and she had a concealed carry permit, and she had a concealed carry license, and a concealed carry firearm, and she accidentally strayed into New Jersey, and she was pulled over. And they arrested her and they charged her with a felony and they convicted her. Now, most people felt that that was perhaps excessive, but she was in literal violation of law. And the New Jersey governor wound up pardoning her because he's like, look, this person didn't mean to, to break the law. She, they would just accidentally straight into our state. So, you know, the pardon is maybe is a power where it's like, you know, even though it's a literal violation of law, this just doesn't make sense. So we can just say, let's not do that. And, and on, on one level, the prosecutor has the original pro, uh, part in authority, depending on your point of view, because there's this huge thing called prosecutorial discretion. The prosecutor has massive discretion on what charges to bring in the first place. So the prosecutor can very well believe someone is fully guilty and choose not to bring charges. So it's like, well, why should only the prosecutor have this power? They're, they're the entry level to the system. Why shouldn't someone else have the power to say, no, let's not do that? So that's... Uh, that's a check on the system. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that. It just, it shouldn't be able to be used for personal reasons. You know what I mean? That's what I feel. Yeah. Well then that's fair, but then you're left with a, the next challenge of if it's going to be based on some other standard, what is that standard and how do you measure that? Yeah, so you have the, to draw the, 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 the idea at least was that when we are electing the president, we are implicitly trusting his judgment to elect him to that level. And surely he will be a, a person who is capable of uh, exercising this unquestioned power. So you can debate with the founders on how well that turned out from your point of view. Yeah. Well, I'll even use a fancy word for it. It's a plenary power. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cardo640 asks what microphone you're using. I'm using a Shure SM58 condenser uh it's a one inch diaphragm that's built into a, for some reason, Radio Shack microphone body. It's a Shure SM58. I used to work for Radio Shack. We, we, we sort of, everyone knew. Uh, Radio Shack had a, had a way of doing all these private label deals. Even the batteries, the Radio Shack batteries were actual Duracell batteries. They were fully charged. There was nothing wrong with them, but they were sold as Radio Shack brand. And, they competed with Duracell. Like I don't understand what the whole like it made it made zero sense to me. And when Radio Shack went out of business, I I secretly celebrated a little bit. 
because I always disagreed with their business practices. Really? You said that you liked shopping there, though, for all the equipment that they had, right? Oh, yeah. I miss having quick access to parts, even if the parts are a little bit expensive or not always the best. But um, when the, the whole fabrication and 3D print, Radio Shack missed the boat. They really missed an opportunity because they could have become this amazing makerspace, an educational place to learn about 3D printing and, and all this. And instead, they kept kept really pushing the consumer route, the the most consumer oriented things that they could mark up the bit the, the, the most but the problem was is you don't get longevity you don't build a relationship with your customer when you're always trying to sell them crap they don't need yeah radio shack forgot about their staple in my humble opinion forgot about their their core competency literally radio shack literally radios and parts to build radios like they forgot about the core competency of, of people who you can't go anywhere else can you go i needed to order i'll show you i needed to order ultra capacitors these things are really awesome they're about 20 bucks a piece they're several thousand microfarads and um they're going to be used in my spot welder back here yeah you couldn't. You basically you can't even go to a Radio Shack anymore and find any kind of capacitor, at all. I had to order all that specially. That's fine. I mean, there's a million parts too. So, you know, can you go to Radio Shack and what if you need a two and a half percent of a tolerance resistor pack instead of the ten percent that Radio Shack sells? Like, I get it. There's definitely some limitations there, but for the vast majority of electronics projects, they could carry some assortment of parts. And and it just was never really done right. It was always kind of a half-assed kind of thing since, at least since I worked there, since the 90s. I'm going to answer a couple questions here from chat. Super Ninja Show says, my sister wants to be a lawyer, but she's four. Is it too late? No, I had plenty of people in my law school class who were uh, in second careers. Uh, so it's not unusual to have people yeah. who are doing second careers in law. My, my only advice here would be to make sure you do your full due diligence on this, um, especially in terms of salaries. Um, lawyer yeah. salaries are what's called bimodal, which means that there's, there's two huge peaks. So there's a huge peak of people who are making about $55,000, $60,000 a year. And then there's a peak of people who are making like one thirty a year. So you want to go into law with a pretty good idea of what you want to do with it and look at what the economics are on that and um, make sure that you're contemplating that out. Um, so that would be my recommendation. But um, it's not Yeah, let me add to that by saying that my that you would want to find the career that, that she wants to do first. Yeah. Have her establish a, net, a network a little bit with people, let them know that she's interested in that career and going into law because – Life ex having having the twenty plus years of life experience there is going to be very valuable in the practice of law. I literally come across posts on private lawyers forums like Solo says or Reddit R lawyers, where someone says, "I've only ever worked as a lawyer. What is it like to be something <laughs> yeah, else?" Yeah. And and honestly, that's I, I appreciate that. That person is probably a very good lawyer. I'm not speaking down to anyone who has always worked as a lawyer. But that also scares the crap out of me. Like, how do you know about how anything else in the world works except the law? But that's, you know, I worked in Radio Shack and I worked at, and, and you know, that person's always worked as a lawyer. Maybe, maybe they really, you know, they have other life experience. I, can't, I don't want to discount that in any way. But and we each have our own perspectives. But yeah, it, it, it's a little scary to me. Like, like law, so, so, like for many people, law is their only career and they don't know what, corporate america is like in engineering or accounting or what getting caught up in a uh, multi-level marketing scheme is like i accidentally did for three months um you know these sorts of things i you know it's uh, it's it's all about perspective so she'll have a unique perspective to add and i recommend that she establish what career path she wants to be on before she goes to law school
before you even apply for the LSATs. Figure out yeah. what would make you happy as an attorney. Will you make enough money? And are you comfortable with whatever the either personal or financial investment is that you'll need to make to get started? Yeah, I would also seriously considering um, working for free as an intern in whatever kind of legal office you're thinking about doing. Especially if it's anything public service, prosecutor, defense, lawyers, they'll happily take your, take your free labor. Um, if it's a private practice kind of thing, same kind of thing, you know, just, just hang out, just do some basic clerical work for, you know, even secretarial work for a couple months, do it for yeah. free. I, and the reason I say that is because, um, the, the money you're going to spend on law school and the time cost is well worth the three months of even free labor. So you might be, you would be well advised if, if, if you have to work for free for three months and in, in the, in the field as, as a secretary, you'll, you'll learn a lot about the job for sure. You'll learn a lot about what it's like and you'll get a lot more information. So I would, I strongly recommend that course of action. Um, two more questions. Someone asked about uh, whether or not the president could, uh, uh, pardon himself. It's an unresolved question. The constitution says the president shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States. The way it's phrased suggests it as unqualified. It suggests any part, any offense. So that would presumably cover his own. Uh, it's an untested legal question because no one's ever tried before. Um, I take the position, the answer to the question is yes, but uh, lawyers disagree on this. Um, to the question, can Congress overturn a pardon? Nope, not even with unanimous vote. A pardon once issued is is permanent. It is as the, it is as it never happened. Congress can't undo it because that would uh, be a bill of attainder, which is illegal. Last part about a pardon, though. A pardon is an admission of guilt. You accept a pardon and you accept the guilt by accepting a pardon. So you are admitting to the crimes by accepting a pardon, if I understand correctly. Which means that if Donald Trump accepted a pardon, he probably could never work in politics again in any meaningful way oh well i don't think anybody would want that's very to. scary thought oh my goodness i i don't think um i'm going to have nightmares. can congress right? revoke someone's citizenship no not it natural just, citizenship they can't you, you you seriously like it was not it did not it was not in my head that there will be more donald trump <laughs> after I seriously yeah, the he's, end of the he's donald still trump be presidency Mr. president right like he's still gonna exist like i just that's oh man yeah it's not it doesn't just go poof and stop existing yeah. and i don't mean anything with like threats or death or anything like that i'm not that's not what i'm talking about i just mean like it just didn't occur to me that he's gonna exist in the public eye after after this I mean, look at whatever Clinton. whatever this whatever this manifests as i'm not even predicting that but whatever is about to happen over the next few months and whatever happens with the election and all that even when Donald Trump's presidency is over, again, not 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 predicting any timing. There's going to be more afterwards. You know there's who's going to be really more Donald Trump afterwards. That is a very scary thing. Most presidents keep keep doing things after they're president, but you know who really did like go poof and disappear? George Bush. What happened to that guy? <laughs> He's just like doing he, his own thing now oh, he, he paints some watercolors he, he, and he wrote a book he paints watercolors and he smiles a lot and i think he's like i think he's basically a teenager stuck in an, in an old man's body can a pardon be overturned if the president is impeached no a pardon once issued and granted cannot be overturned so yeah these are this is the collateral damage of having elected someone who would do this that's basically what happens i have one more question for you and then uh that's all i have okay uh, go for daniel it. bake asks um whether plea deals happen before pleas are entered and is there any situation in which a plea deal would happen after the plea was entered what i know that that's a silly question but like some kind of a plea uh, bargaining down the sentence sort of thing i think i know what he's talking about there was something mentioned on a, in a couple of reports today news like from abc or cbs or whatever about how um, Cohen will plead guilty to this. It doesn't say anything about cooperation. And then in a second sort of not plea deal, but in a second deal, he will get some sort of immunity by offering or, or in return for his absolute testimony to Mueller and Congress and DOJ, et cetera, like 100% cooperation. 
so I guess calling that a plea deal wouldn't be the right turn of phrase, but it, that's sort of like a bargaining, isn't it? Um, yeah. That doesn't happen often. Yeah, does it? I don't. I don't know what that is, and I and I that probably happens more often than you might think. Um, lesser criminals fairly often get these kinds of immunity deals to help bring down bigger criminals. Someone, but how often it happens, like quantity wise on a daily basis, I could not tell you. Someone asked, can a pardon be rejected? Yes, it can. I, a pardon can be rejected. A person who is pardoned has to accept the pardon uh, or clemency. Um, and this, this happened actually uh, most recently at the end of Obama's term where he was pardoning or apologize, uh, giving clemency, which is a term for shortening the sentence. Uh, he's given clemency to a whole bunch of drug offenders, and one of them, who was actually serving jail at the time, refused the clemency because he felt that he would be getting a better deal by serving out the remainder of his term. So yes, you can absolutely refuse a pardon um, or a clemency. Hmm. Do we know what he what he meant by thought he was getting a better deal? Yeah, basically the clemency came up uh, came up uh, with a whole bunch of post uh, release conditions in terms of things he'd oh. have to satisfy. And the regular release process didn't come with those conditions, and he felt that he was better off serving the additional year he had to serve. Yeah, especially if he's already more or less used to the institution. Um, yeah. Constitutional amendment to override pardons possible? Sure, you can have a constitutional amendment to do anything except uh, lower a state's representatives in the Senate. You can do anything else, though. So if you want to take a Senate seat away from uh, Maryland, you can't do that. But anything else you can have an amendment for. So yes, you can amend away the part part in power. Good luck on your constitutional amendment efforts. Interesting. Uh, All right. So any last thoughts? Or I'm going to consider that our uh, Wednesday night stream, and I'll see you guys tomorrow when we drop a video about free speech, I think it is. Yep, I'm good. All right. Everybody, uh, I don't have the dogs tonight. They're with my parents, so I can't bring the dogs in. So I'm just going to say good night and thank you for joining us. And I'll, I'll see you uh, in the next video. Love you guys.